Coming up on this week's show, we celebrate our 300th episode. Woo! Woo! <laughs> The Retro Owl podcast is brought to you each week with our wonderful friends at Bitmap Books. Now, their latest book is incredible, The Secret History of Mac Gaming. If you thought the Mac wasn't a gaming platform, it spawned some of the biggest franchises in gaming history. Missed Halo, SimCity, to name but a few, and this spans over 480 pages. You can check it out right now and the rest of their retro gaming books on their website at bitmapbooks.co.uk. <laughs> Hello and welcome to the Retro Hour podcast episode number 300. (laughs) (laughs) Your weekly dose of retro gaming and technology news with me, Dan Wood. Me, Ravi Abbott. And me, Joe Fox. And it is amazing to have you joining us for uh, our celebrations tonight. 300 episodes of this uh, little podcast that Ravi and I decided to start on a drunken night out in Amsterdam. Yeah. uh, Almost six years ago now. Um, um, just when podcasting was not popular and, yep. it, and it wasn't kicking off and it was kind of, it was going down and then suddenly the wave went up. We rode that wave all <laughs> the way, baby. It, yeah. <laughs> but it is, I mean, you know, the fact that we thought we put a couple of shows out, didn't we, and see how well it did. And the fact that we're still doing this every week, you know, I had this mad idea of getting a guest on every single week, which actually in hindsight was pretty nuts to do. But um, we've done it, you know, with our, with our incredible listeners and our patrons and all these guests that we've had as well. We've got just an archive that I've got to say I'm really proud of. Yeah, like I, the main thing that I love about the podcast is that it's an archive of like developers mm. and telling the stories, you know, we've, We've had people that have sadly passed away yep. that have been on the podcast and now like their stories are actually preserved, which I, I just think's awesome. And like also I just love getting together with you guys. Like even during this pandemic time and stuff, it's 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 kept me sane and like it's it's just been fun to get together and now we're actually all in the same room oh my god is, just yeah mad. i'm still yeah. really nervous I, I don't even know what to say like i'm so nervous that we're live i'm so nervous that we've got all these amazing guests <laughs> on with us right now in the background but yeah man episode 300 i'm i'm so 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 happy i'm so excited um and like you guys like ravi just stole my line now i was gonna say i've just loved hanging out with two of my best yeah, friends yeah like the last six oh, years. Oh, you guys. And hopefully it just keeps going. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, we are actually in studio for the first time in 18 months. Um, I can look across the table into their, their beautiful faces. Um, and also, we are streaming this live to our patrons on YouTube as well. We're going to be putting out a video version of this show, as if it wasn't complicated enough, you know, just to add a bit of extra complication there as well. We've got trick-or-treaters in the background. Yeah, so we're recording yeah. it on Halloween, so if you hear some noise, <laughs> dogs barking and everything, all part of that live atmosphere. And we thought for our 300th episode, I mean, you know, this show's never been about us guys. It's always been about our guests. And we thought, 300 Let's get three guests on. And actually, we've got three incredible guests, three friends of the show who we've had on before, but you know, it's always amazing catching up with them. And actually, a few of our guests haven't been on for a long, long time. Um, so let's welcome on our first guest, the fantastic Clint from LGR. How are you doing, Clint? Greetings. I am doing quite well. Uh, yeah, good to be again, uh, back here again. Yeah, I mean, it was, we were looking and we thought you were on about two years ago. It's five years you were last on this podcast, which, you know, half a decade has gone by since we last caught up with you. Um, (laughs) You're you're on 1.5 million, over 1.5 million subs now as well. That, you know, you must be proud of that. Oh, yeah. It's been a weird five years. Like, honestly, Mm. this past five years has been the most exciting, the most growth, the most, you know, just things taking off and uh, stuff happening in terms of videos, um, connecting with people that I never thought they would. So, uh, yeah, I've got a Wikipedia page now. It's crazy. Oh, wow. That's (laughs) what you know. You're you're famous now. (laughs) It's like, oh, man, finally, they're not getting deleted every single time somebody tries to. It's like somebody. I I tried to make one for myself and that got removed. Not notable. According to some metric, it's notable now. So yeah, exciting times. Good five years. <laughs> oh, well, great to have you back, Clint. Thank you so much for joining us this week. Um, and let's let's welcome on our second special guest, uh, fresh from the red carpet at Ashen's new movie last night, Kim Justice. How are you doing, Kim? Hey guys, how are you doing? Lovely to be back here. Congratulations oh. on three hundred. Oh, thank you so much. And uh, how was the uh, the Ashens movie? Then can you can you say anything about it? Or, uh... Oh yeah, no, it was mm. wonderful. It was nice to properly see it on big screen in um, yeah. Odeon in Leicester Square. It's a it's a lovely little movie. Um, nice little sort of send up comedy heist sort of thing. Um, and yeah, just a fantastic atmosphere. Lovely to see a lot of people as well. Again, people who I haven't seen since the start of all lockdown business. Mm. 
yeah, pretty hectic night being a Halloween weekend in London, as you can imagine. Oh, Lots God, yeah. People dressed in ridiculous garb and all that. But yeah, it was a right good laugh. And your channel, I mean, we were all talking before we started the episode, you know, the videos you've been doing recently, these documentaries that you just continue to put out. That Literally, I was saying to the guys before, your channel is one of these I can put on. I want to watch, I'll, I'll watch one video of Kim's before you know I've been watching all night. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> incredible. What's your latest one then, the, the SimCity one? So my latest one is Sim City. Yes, um, actually came from. I mean, it's something I've been kind of thinking about for a while. But um, one of my patrons actually really kind of gave me the impetus. Said, "Oh, I'd really love you to do documentary in real life. You find so much interesting stuff if you have a look at Sim City." And it just, as those sort of things kind of do, just drives you down a certain rabbit hole of just looking through the research, finding all the different things that inspired the game, the struggles that he had with actually trying to originally get it out there, and also the um mainstream impacts that it had um a lot of the um polit- political stuff that it kind of ended up inspiring there's just so much there it just ended up getting longer and longer and um but yeah it finally managed to put it out this friday and quite happy with the reception yeah everyone needs to check it out i mean you know your, your videos are just incredible kim and it's uh great to have you back on the show as well it's been way too long i think since we had you on thank you and uh, next, um, he had to come on and, you know, keep up his title of being our most frequent guest because we love him so much. This is uh, Dimitris from uh, Modern Vintage Gamer. How you doing, buddy? I'm, gr- I'm great. Thanks. Uh, thanks for having me on, gents. And uh, Kim, uh, it's great to finally meet you. Uh, I'm, I was, we're talking earlier, I'm a big fan of, of your work and, um, and Clint as well. I mean, you know, uh, Joe was saying he felt a little overwhelmed, overawed with all the guests here. I'm kind of feeling a little nervous myself, believe it or not, but um, it's great to be here. Congrats on the 300, guys. Um, I've been listening. I don't want to – I'm not going to lie and say I've listened to every single episode, but I, I, I've listened to the first episode all the way up till now. Missed a couple along the way, but mm. um, you guys are just great. You put on a great show and I listen um, when I can most of the time, and um, it's great to, great to be back. Uh, thanks oh. for having me on. Really appreciate that. I mean, you know, your channel as well, another must-watch channel. Um, I, I did actually see you were disappointed with the N64 emulation on the Switch as well. I was watching that video earlier. Yeah, um, not happy. Hopefully yeah. I'll catch it. Um, <laughs> I, and and it's, look, it just goes back to my memories of buying an N64 and playing the original hardware and um, knowing how it feels, you know. And and look, I think I think I mentioned this in the video, but to the average person that picks this up and plays it, they're they're gonna have a great experience they're gonna be fine Mm. but to kind of the old old school guys like me um that played n64 on a crt there's just something off about the whole thing so hey um it actually hit trending on on youtube which is not something i i can say that's happened to me very often i think it's like the second or third time in the my entire youtube career so if Nintendo sees it, hopefully they'll they'll make some patches. We'll see. <laughs> or maybe they'll just like block the video, which they've done before as well with me. <laughs> I know your history with Nintendo, yeah. <laughs> but ho- hopefully, uh, hopefully they'll they'll address it. I mean, there's a lot of there's a lot of um, public. Um, there's not just me. I, I, there's other videos that have, have come out. Um, big mainstream websites have talked about the N64 um, service. It's not particularly great. So hopefully Nintendo will will offer um, a solution to it. Was the virtual console a bit better like pr- on, on previous generations? Yes and no. So the Wii virtual console was way better, Ravi, but the Wii U virtual console is actually worse. Um, oh, okay. Which is interesting, but there's the, the input lag uh, was introduced with the Wii U virtual console. Um, and there's also, and I don't know if you've really looked at the virtual console in a while, but... There was this this kind of this dark filter that was applied to all the games on the Wii U that really just kind of washed out the colors. And um, if you go back and compare it to the Wii Virtual Console, which of course doesn't exist anymore, um, the games are way better on the Wii Virtual Console. Really good. Well, yeah. I'm sure we're going to get into that and lots more as well um, over the next hour. Um, I'm sure this hour is going to fly by as well. I think we could do easily a three or four hour show with uh, our incredible guests this week. I mean, before we get into some of the topics, we're going to do a bit of a, a retro kind of roundtable discussion. But also, we've had some uh, little messages left by um, friends of the show as well. Should we hear one now? Yeah, yeah go for it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Hey, you crazy dudes at the Retro Hour podcast. This is the Metal Jesus and love what you guys do. I've been listening to you guys for years now. You guys are amazing, and congratulations on hitting 300 awesome episodes. Can't wait to see what you guys do for the next 300. All right, have a great one. 
Oh, Metal Jesus rocks. We love him. And um, thank you so much for that, mate. Uh, we'll be playing more of those throughout the show as well. We've got a few topics to talk about, though. Why don't we get straight into the first one, Ravi? Yeah. So, thinking, you know, we haven't really been to events. Mm. And, uh, you know, things have changed quite a lot. And um, I know, I think you went to VCF East, didn't you, uh, Clint? And um, Kim, you've, you've gone to play Expo and stuff. We're just wondering, like, what, what what events are kind of like in the uh, post COVID world, and do you think they'll get to like the levels that they were before? Because really, before COVID happened, they were massively kicking off. Mm. Like we were going to Lowe's all around the world. So, uh, uh, what are events like in this new world? Well, it's kind of weird because I've been to a couple of events recently. I went to EGX in um, at the XL for a bit, um, and. As far as like post COVID events go, you could really see the struggles with that one. Um, that there were no major exhibits at all. Like there was no Sega, no Nintendo, no Sony, um, and a lot of, and a lot of people were complaining. Like there was all sort of hashtags like EGX refund and so forth, which was a a bit disappointing. I mean, I was kind of thinking, I was trying to see like, like the good side of it because obviously like these people want to put on a decent event, they don't want to put on a like rubbish. But if you can't get the people, you can't get the people. And maybe it would have been better for them to wait a year. But then just the profits that events must bring, you can see why they might have gone sooner. I mean, with Play Expo Blackpool that I just went to, it's kind of weird to say about the sort of post-COVID that because, I mean, anyone who's been to that event in particular will know that it's a place where time seems to just stand still. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, it's Blackpool is perpetually stuck in the 1970s, and uh, the venue itself, the Norbert Castle, is. Um, I don't know if Demetrius and Clint are familiar, but you should look it up. You should look up the reviews of this place. It's like it's, Castle. Yeah. <laughs> it's like Castle cold it. Um, it is or faulty towers. Faulty towers. Yes, it is a true, <laughs> amazing, ridiculous place. Um, but um. So, yeah, in Blackpool, it was kind of a mixed bag of people, some people sort of respecting, like, masks and so forth, wearing them, a lot of people, to be honest, not. Um, but there was a good spirit, at least, of people trying to muck in and make the event as good as possible. But, yeah, I think it's still... It's hard to see, like, when events are going to get back to as they were before covid i feel yeah. we're because we're just not there yet in so many ways the virus is still very much kicking around so i think we've still got at least another year or more of waiting and seeing night and sort of normalizing a process to deal with this really mm. it, from an events perspective how do you find it over there clint then at, in terms of vcf because i know it looked incredible it looked very busy as well from your video yeah it was a uh, vintage computer festival midwest i know east mm. also happened since then um which is uh, one I haven't attended. They're all kind of their own little thing. But the, the Midwest one, they did a really good job in terms of making it as decent as possible for everyone to get in and get out and keep things clear in terms of entrances and exits and all that. Very clear signage. And there was a mask mandate by the local county health, whatever it is. And so thankfully, everybody that I saw anyway were sticking to that. So that made it easier instead of just having it be an optional thing. And when it's <laughs> enforced by somebody up higher, you know, and they're, they're saying, okay, well, you can't just uh, gather indoors and do anything you want. So th that at least gave it sort of a somebody else to hand off the blame to if because people were complaining to me and complaining to everybody else like, oh, you know, but it's it is what it is. And so uh, you kind of dealt with it or didn't. So <laughs> It came there and just sort of uh, had as much fun as we could. It was around, I think, 75 to 80% of the number of people that had attended previously. But, I mean, this was still over a 1,000 folks in a pretty small building. So it was bizarre at first. But, uh, yeah, I mean, once it got going, it felt like any other uh, event like that that I had been to. Just, you know, with, with folks sort of coming and going a little bit quicker. They weren't lingering nearly as, as long. So mm -hmm. there was a, a lot less of just the uh, general hangout vibe. It was just, yeah, you, you came in, did your thing and went for a lot of the people, you know, some folks still wanted to hang around, but at that one in particular, there was always this longer, just chilling after the show kind of thing for mm -hmm. about, you know, up until midnight and most folks that just didn't do that, at least uh, how it had been in the past. So that kind of part of it, if you go to events like this, like I like to do is just, you know, hang out with people and then 
you know, maybe not necessarily do the event stuff so much. I just like hanging out. And that part yeah. really wasn't there. It's not quite there yet, uh, which is, you know, it is what it is. But I was at least able to, um, you know, see everybody that I wanted to and, you know, did uh, uh, my own table for the first time there, which kind of helped. Previously, I had just attended these things as a person, just yeah. <laughs> wandering the halls. So uh, having that sort of central area to, to hang helped in, in my case, you know, just logistically, but uh, yeah, it, it's, it was still, I, I wasn't even sure up until like two or three days before, if it was going to go on still, just mm. because it, it felt like that touch and go, there were people dropping out. There were like, you know, half the people, the YouTubers that were going to attend ended up not attending. There were four people, four or five people that dropped out with that week prior maybe so it was right. you know up until the very night of the show i'm like is this actually going to happen or not like i don't know what's <laughs> going on but uh yeah it was it was nice to be able to do i mean it would totally do it again if it were under similar circumstances in terms of like having clear rules i think that was the biggest thing for me I, yeah it, just having like rules <laughs> that people were supposed to follow as opposed to just random guidelines which like where I live now, we, we've never had anything like that in this county. So it's literally county to county. It can change. And so you never really know with events. You know, you can go literally across the line and full open events with no masking, no mandates, no nothing. And then the other county across from me, it's vaccinations required to even go right. to an event at all. And they limit the number of people. So, yeah, it's, the vagaries are what makes things odd right now, I think. Yeah, it all changes day by day, doesn't it? Um, what about you, Dimitri? Yeah. Have you been to any events since post-COVID? No, the last event I went to was in 2019, which was uh, the Portland Retro Gaming Expo, which it's been almost two years now since that event. Mm. Um, I, uh, I'm a little, I was a little nervous about going back to events this year. I was asked to attend a couple of them, but I thought I'm going to sit it out for another year um, next year. Hopefully, um, you know, E3 will, will come back and I'll, I'll probably go there and maybe one or two other events. But no, I, I was more than happy just to sit out this year and and just see what, what was going on. But I, I am very, very glad to see that um, some events are starting up again and it seems like people are slowly starting to trickle back to these events, which is really cool. Because I think, you know, these retro events, especially in the US, Clint, Clint knows, um, there used to be a, a lot of them throughout the whole calendar year. And I think, unfortunately, some of them have probably fallen off now because, you know, the, the smaller ones probably won't survive or haven't survived um, mm. this year and last year. But I think it also gives um, the bigger events more focus, you know, to really put on really some really good shows. So, yeah, I think for me next year will be hopefully as long as, you know, things don't get worse, which I'm, I'm hopeful they won't, um, I'll, I'll be back at events next year. I, I think maybe like the plan forward, because obviously people need to kind of keep the money flowing, like you said, and uh, keep these events kind of going, uh, would instead of trying to fill the huge venues that they used to before, maybe do like half the size and then mm. sell out that and then try and expand kind of that way. I think at the moment there seems to be a lot of trying to fill the space that you had before, which is, uh, yeah, maybe a way forward just to go smaller and sell out and just keep it going like you said and uh then then you've got a future of, of kind of events yeah and places like the the norbreg castle i mean you know without us guys there to you know support the bar tab the place to go bankrupt <laughs> I think, you know, you know i just <laughs> want to mention everybody go i know clint and demetrius won't know what it is but everybody goes on about the norbreg castle my my auntie got married there wow because <laughs> <laughs> my family are actually from blackpool which just kind of says a lot about me <laughs> you page boy at the wedding yeah. <laughs> hopefully it didn't smell of effluent back in those days <laughs> it probably did <laughs> well i mean on our show we have to talk about what's been happening in the news um in retro gaming as well um i don't know if you've seen this about the halo 3 original servers shutting down along with the rest of the series on the Xbox 360. And that was something the other day that, you know, now that's kind of that system, the Xbox 360, which doesn't feel that long ago to me, is now considered retro. I mean, is this something that, is it unreasonable, do you think, to expect servers to stay up forever? And uh, do you think that's going to affect game preservation? I know maybe you've got an opinion on that, Demetrius. Um I think it's probably unreasonable to think that servers will stay al online forever. Mm -hmm. As much as I, I don't like when, when services like that get shuttered, 
I'm, I tend to speak out about things like that. But unfortunately, you're right, Dan. I was thinking about this myself the other day that the 360s two generations ago, you know, yeah. but we don't really think we don't really think that it is because the Xbox One and the Xbox Series consoles they they're not one and the same, but they they kind of get lumped in together all the time. Like when you buy when you buy an Xbox Series game. When you buy the physical game, it says Xbox One and Xbox Series on on the cover. So you know the backward compatibility is is, is kind of um, implied. So it's a matter of well, it just kind of feels like that this generation, the last generation for Microsoft is kind of one and the same. And then before that was the 360, but we tend to forget the 360 came out in 2005, and the world was a wow. very different place <laughs> back in 2005. So, not really a huge surprise that the service is being um, shut down. It's very, very sad to see that that's happening. But I think you know the original point. Eventually, all of these services, these servers are going to go offline. Um, as much as I don't like it, um, it's just the, the the reality of things when. They don't want to spend the money to keep the servers running. You know, the the, the cost, uh, they're upside down on the cost and um, it's just time to, you know, take things offline, unfortunately. I remember watching, um, God, it must have been, well, Clint's video you did actually, it was when the, the Xbox 360 Slim Edition came out and you did the comparison video between the two and yeah, that must have been over a decade ago now. That's oh, crazy. Yeah. yeah, it was like that was like 2010 or something. I'm yeah. I'm actually working on a, a 10th anniversary video about Skyrim now. There's wow. a, oh, God. A, a decade, <laughs> a decade of that game being released 40 times over. Um, and now there's another <laughs> another re-release coming out. So that's I think an interesting sort of other side of this is whenever one of these games, big games, uh, goes offline, I always wonder. I'm like, okay, well, when's the remaster coming, which is going to have like new servers? Because mm. anytime a big Halo type of thing comes out and uh, or or is it goes down, I always just expect something else is going to come out to replace it because there's still money to be made there, but they want to do it in their own way. Um, yeah, I was just thinking about that here, writing my Skyrim script that doesn't rely on servers necessarily, but I was running into one thing where you can no longer actually buy the original version of Skyrim anymore or its DLC on Steam. It's been delisted. Right. I, di- I didn't realize that. I was going through there in my library. I'm like, okay, let's get the original one because I don't want to show the special or the upgraded or the HD whatever. And I couldn't find it. I'm like... Well, that's so stupid. <laughs> I, the, even little basic things like that, even it doesn't have to be multiplayer servers. It's just they re-release the game and then all of a sudden mm. the original is no longer there. And then that part of it annoys me too in terms of wanting to go back and recapture the game as it looked and played and everything in 2011. So I had to go and dig out my physical DVD with the key and everything and install it that way, um, and put it to my Steam account. Thankfully, it still lets you download it if you have the key. But uh, yeah, just it's a constant thorn in my side whenever something like that happens. And I can't help but see announcements like that of a server going down and being like, yep, they're just going to re-release it at some point. <laughs> yeah. We saw it with um, Grand Theft Auto, didn't we? When Vice City and San Andreas, yeah. you know, the, the new trilogy was announced and you can't get the originals anywhere. They've been taken off. They're doing PSA that with that too. That's yeah. so yeah. annoying. Ah, <laughs> yeah. It's bad. Yeah. It's awesome game. I saw a viral tweet um, not to a few days back, actually. Someone had found an, a 360 in the wild, and it still had the Blades dashboard on it. Oh, wow. And so everyone was just like, oh, my God, the Blades dashboard. It was so much <laughs> better than the one that replaced they replaced it with, which was just nothing. And, and it's stuff like that that just makes you feel quite old. Because, I mean, to me, I don't know about you guys, the 90s was still like 10 years ago. Yeah. Not even that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I mean, as far as servers go, I guess, I mean, I mean, obviously for games like Halo, as Clint says, there's always going to be remasters and stuff for the popular stuff. I suppose for other stuff from the, perspe- from the perspective of preservation, the fans often have to do the legwork in a lot of cases, don't they? Yeah, there's when like fan-made like, uh, resurrections. Games. Yeah, yeah. I, was, I was going to say, I imagine, you know, hopefully 10 years down the line, we'll be commenting on about how like the Halo 3 server that somebody still has open is now like yeah, closing yeah. down or something. <laughs> They've got a multiplayer game with 10,000 kills in or something like that. But um, that kind of actually, I'm skipping a few topics here, which we'll come back to, but where do you guys kind of think retro gaming or gaming in general is probably going to go in like the next kind of 10 years? Because as Dan said, you know, the Xbox 360 and the PS3 are kind of like, they could be seen as retro now, but you know, 
you need so you need the internet for so many of these games and stuff like that. Where where do you guys see it in ten years time? I will we'll start with you, Demetrius. Uh Remakes and remasters, I think, is yeah. is the yeah. is the way forward. Really, I mean, I've I worked on Quake. Um, we've got mm-hmm. other games at Night Dive that we're working on that we're bringing back. I mean, I think a lot of studios, a lot of publishers, are really big on on remakes now um whether the remake is is better than the original is kind of irrelevant but um i think there's i think a lot of publishers are seeing the value of remaking i mean dead space was announced for a remake um there's i I think really that's kind of the way forward with with um you know the next kind of generation or two of, of video games i think there's a lot of value there for that that kind of stuff what do you think ken i think um yeah, remakes again is something that seems to become quite normalised. I remember a few years ago, you'd get a remake announced, and a lot of people would complain. And it seems like gradually less and less people are kind of almost just seeing it as remake remasters. Even in like cases where it's a game that's only a couple of years old, that seems to then suddenly get a remake come out for it. Um, I think as far as um, the future goes, I mean, certainly it seems like all of this is going to be digital. For a start, I mean, the physical physical media just seems to be not longed for this world, especially when it comes to new games. And even for older games, whether it's the prices going up to ridiculous levels being pushed up through rather illicit means or the general degradation of physical media goes in general, you're going to see more and more retro people turn into things like the Mister and Raspberry Pis and so forth to mm. get an authentic experience, which... I think in in some ways not necessarily it's not necessarily bad at all because I mean that opens anything that can't like that that opens it up more to people is something I'm here for. I mean if we were still just relying on physical media for our old games as opposed to everything else and the price is going up as it is it become a much more insular hobby and it would just die out in the end. Mm. And and you're getting like discless systems coming out and stuff, and they're often the cheaper option. So more people might might be getting them. You know, discs and physicality seem to be a bit of a luxury. Like you know, that's like swearing to our ears. Oh, no. <laughs> Sorry, I, I was literally thinking I can't imagine Clint's too happy about that. Like, with where well, things are going. Yeah, the, the the weird thing is, I bought one of those discless systems with the oh, PS5 wow. <laughs> because I realized that with the uh, PS4, I had the PS4 and a PS4 Pro, and I bought a grand total of two physical games for that entire wow. platform. Oh, but okay. I had over a hundred digitally, just because it was it was getting easier at that point when I finally got a an internet connection that wasn't throttled and you know had caps and all these things. So it made more sense at that point. Just because I don't play consoles very much at all. I, I play stuff mostly on PC and everything on PC is pretty much digital. It's been that way for such a long time that I was already getting used to it. And so by the time the PS5 came around, I'm like, well, fine, this one's available. And I, I, <laughs> I purchased it and it's been been OK. Uh, and if, for these kind of systems anyway, it doesn't really seem like having the physical copy makes much more of a difference to preservation anyway, because all these servers are going to go down or some other thing is going to break, or they're just going to re-release it or redo it in some other form, or hopefully eventually it'll all be uh, able to be emulated and imitated and simulated on some, like that's my dream is that retro just goes to a completely platform agnostic thing where we're just running code on some other device. We don't have to rely on old things at all. That would be great. I mean, which seems a little absurd considering how much <laughs> of what I do <laughs> relies on the old hardware and software. Yeah, but I know that that's... Actually, uh... <laughs> you're breaking my heart with your realism. <laughs> like, like, physically, like, oh my God. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm physically surrounded by old games and boxes and I've got a massive collection of things over there. And I just, I've been enthralled with this original Xbox over there that I got the other week. And it's like... I'm having a ton of fun with that, but I know that we're in this weird little finite period of time where it's just a transition to whatever's next. And I don't know, I just sort of ex- accepted, I guess, five or six years ago where it's like, this, this is where it's going and you either embrace it now and have fun now, or you just get really cranky. And, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, I think both are, are they're valid, but <laughs> somewhere in between for me is where I found the most enjoyment because there's that, that, that trade off between, uh, ease of access right now versus not having it at all later in the future. And I know that they're constantly tugging at each other because, you know, we're making trade-offs now, uh, 
by not being able to have these things in the future, perhaps. perhaps. That's- it, it does seem that way, doesn't it? I mean, if you look at the PS5, the the two SKUs, right, the old digital, which I think was the one that they really wanted to to push, and then mm. it seems like they just added that Blu-ray drive as an afterthought because yeah. people, you know, there was some market research that said some people still want physical games, and the Xbox is the same. I mean, the Series S is, a, is an all-digital system, um, and it's selling very, very well, and then there's the Series X for the physical. So you just wonder... What's next? You know, what the next generation will bring? Is it just going to be, it's going to completely eliminate the drives? I kind of feel like they will. I hate the fact that they they will do that, but I, I'm with Clint. I feel like that's the way things are going. Yeah, it's the way of the future, isn't it? I mean, do the PCs that you work on have drives on them? Mostly, I mean, mine doesn't. I mean, well, I mine still has a five and a quarter inch oh, floppy wow. drive, but that's yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's a little bit of an exception. <laughs> yeah, you do make an interesting yeah. point there because I mean, on my Nintendo Switch, pretty much all of my library in there now for the last eighteen months has all been digital games. But I kind of wonder, you know, yeah, one day those servers are going to get turned off, and am I going to lose them? And I think, you know, Demetrius, obviously, you do a lot of videos about piracy, mm-hmm. and I think in the end, that's probably going to be the way that I imagine the best bet for getting preservation. In the future. Uh, unfortunately, or fortunately, which, whichever side of the fence you're on, um, emulation and piracy, ROMs and all that stuff is really what will save video game preservation. Mm. Yeah, totally. I agree. I agree. <laughs> what do you think of systems like, um, you know, recently we've seen FPGA systems have come along that are kind of, you know, not quite emulation, obviously, that reinterpreting the original hardware in a new form. Um, do you, I've, I've not seen if you've covered anything like that, Clint, on your channel. Is there anything that you've you've got? I actually literally yesterday picked up uh, a system that I might go into it in the future um, mm. with uh, the Mister Project and everything. So I'm really looking forward to diving into that because it intrigues me a lot, especially for the uh, the hardware that isn't very feasible for most folks to get like arcade machines and, you know, import computers and such, which have become unobtainable. I think that there's a lot more in that as opposed to, um, you know, I I feel like I have a hundred different ways to emulate a PlayStation by now. So I'm really not Mm. interested in, in that necessarily the console side of things, but the, the other side where it is getting very, very close in accuracy to these arcade boards, which I collect those too, but I've already had like two or three of those die on me in the past couple of years. So it's like that kind of thing where it's the more complex it gets and the more able to, uh, simulate complex chips in that way i think is great i mean i'm even seeing like uh computer sound cards for ms dos machines being recreated with a little fpga on an isa card which is nuts you know and then all mm. of a sudden you can get these chips that haven't been manufactured in 25 30 years and just stick that on a board and then add that to some other machine that i already have i think there's a ton of potential there that we're just beginning to see in terms of uh getting these older impossible to remanufacture chips uh put on some other system like that and you know again going to that sort of dream of mine of just being platform agnostic whatever just have a thing that does it all and does it to such a way that is indistinguishable from the original especially for you know the the really unobtainium stuff i think i i really love the idea that there's like multiple cores on there as well so a lot of people would just choose it for one system or, or, or a few that they want to emulate or, you know, looking at the Neo Geo collection. But then they might go, oh, I want to look at this other system or I'm going to try and explore this one. And it kind of opens it up to systems that people maybe would have never had access to or, or, or couldn't even touch back in the day. So, yeah, I think that's really valuable. Yeah, and I'm looking here on our um, YouTube chat. Um, James Walker, he said, Mr is the only way he's going to get to play a proper Acorn Archimedes machine. So, yeah, for those systems that are just, you know, you can't get a hold of in certain parts of the world or are getting ridiculously expensive now, it does open it up to more people. I I don't have one yet, um, a mister, um, because I have a lot of hardware. I actually have an Archimedes as well, so I don't need a mister for that. Um, I've got an X68000, a PC98. Now, eventually, these things are going to start breaking down and um, maybe I'll look into it then, but right now... Um, I, I've been keeping an eye on on that whole um, scene, and it looks really, really cool. But I haven't jumped in yet myself. I think it's something I'll I'll, I'll get around to at some point, though. But you can, yeah, I'm going to jump into it eventually. I know I am just for the potential from a computer side again, talking about things like Acorn Archimedes and 
things like that. And, you know, the more obscure the computer system, the better. Um, I'm just, as someone who's kind of more casual on the front, especially when it comes to the technological aspect, I'm having a look at stuff and making sure, you know, is setting up going to, am I going to be able to accomplish it without, you know, falling over it all collapsing and me crying on the floor? Um, <laughs> <laughs> um but it's, it seems to be getting more and more open on that front, which I'm very glad to see. And, I mean, again, especially I think for computers as well, that's particularly what I'm interested in as someone who doesn't necessarily have the space or room to set up all the things I have on that front. Having it all in a little cube, like, as accurate as can be, is incredibly appealing to me to get that mm. experience. Yeah, it interests me as well, because obviously, you know, Dimitris, you mentioned then you've got a and Acorn Archimedes in the US. Mm. Um, and I, I've got one as well. And I think it's a great machine, you know, cause here in Britain, we use them at school. You know, they were like our, our school machines. Have you got any experience with, with those, Clint? Or is that like a platform you'd like to look at? Oh, yeah. I, I saw my very first one at Vintage Computer Festival Midwest, actually. Oh, wow. I have uh, always been intrigued by that whole platform, you know, being early on in the risk-based stuff and, you know, sort of that competitor-ish to the uh, Atari ST Amiga scene. It's just uh, fascinating. I, you know, I've got a number of games that I'd like to try. You know, the Archimedes version of SimCity recently came in from Neil, actually, RMC, and he sent that over and he's like, this is terrible. You can have this version. So, <laughs> like, okay, sure. I'll add it to my collection. But, you know, this, yeah, I've, I've never uh, actually had any experience other than just, you know, tapping on the keyboard and looking at that one at the show recently and just, I don't know, the aesthetic about it, I guess, is the, the design cosmetically looks really great for some reason. I don't know, the different color keys and the layout and just that 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 style of machine. We didn't get mm. too much over here. That I'd love to grab one sometime. And there are some games on there that I actually think, uh, you know, I'm going to get hate now, actually superior to the Amiga versions. Lemmings uh, is yeah, dumb Lemmings good on there. That. It's yeah. fantastic, you're, right. you're right, Dan. I, I agree with you. Lemmings is really good. Um there's there's some games that are better on the Archimedes than on the Amiga. I've, I've got a couple of big box Archimedes games. I've got about seven or eight of them, and and um, yeah, some of them are, are superior. There's no no question. Mm. Archimedes Elite is really strong. And yep. Yeah, really looks lovely. Yeah, it kind of feels very at home on that platform, being the spiritual successor to the BBC Micro, doesn't it? Oh yeah, for sure. But yes, Archimedes what? SimCity, not so much. That was done by a Chrysalis of all people. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, they were a company that did a lot of um, ports, weren't they, of games from other platforms to the Archimedes? Some were hit, yeah. some were good, yeah, but they weren't they weren't all, um, yeah, hits. There's even Wolfenstein. There's an official Wolfenstein yeah. port. I have the floppy disk for that really? as well, and that, yeah, yeah, it's it's really really cool. It's huh. um, it's it's an official port. So uh, yeah, it's a it's a fascinating system um, mm. to to kind of dive into and, and read up on. Well, it's interesting having you know. Kim and uh, us guys been over in the UK and you guys been in the US. Um, it's quite interesting to talk a bit about the retro market. I mean, obviously, Clint, you know, your, your famous thrift episodes, you know, some of my favorite videos that you do on your channel. Um, have you been thrifting recently and have you found any bargains or is it getting harder these days now that people know the value? <laughs> yeah, it's it's an interesting mixture of uh, people knowing the value, the thrift stores knowing the value or at least knowing how to look on ebay and find a value yeah. and then uh, a, a lot of folks knowing where i thrift now and then going to the stores and finding everything before i get there um, yeah. which <laughs> that's an interesting side effect i didn't really think about um, there are people that make pilgrimages just to come and see the store with whatever is in the video so yeah i haven't actually found much recently at all in the past year or two in particular it's extremely dried up so it's one of the reasons maybe uh there's just more people out there looking, but of course, you know, now I, I, I'm finding more and more of the stuff just ends up uh, overpriced and, and either put up on the Goodwill auction site or eBay or something along those lines because, yeah, it's it's very rare that I find anything retro gaming related. Mm -hmm. And whenever I find something retro computer related, it's usually uh, <laughs> like a copy of... I don't know, print master gold or something. It's still in the box. Like it's just very mostly boring. And I bet, stuff. I bet, I bet you bought that. I mean, yeah, sure, but yeah, you know, <laughs> I had to. You know, it's, like, it's something. Yeah. yeah, it's something, right? Just to see anything at all that is within that realm is. I mean, you know, I used to find uh, like every single one of my Xbox games that I have. I found all those thrifting, but that was all. Mm. 
over four years ago now. I mean, every single one of those was found between like 2012 to 2016 or so. And uh, that was sort of a sweet spot, I think, for finding that kind of... I, I don't even find those. Xbox, PS2, GameCube, none of that. Um, and yeah, even... <laughs> I don't know. I just can't remember even the last time I saw a game in a thrift store. I guess that's... What about you, Dimit? Yeah. Kim, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. I guess that's just a vicious... I mean, it seems to be a vicious cycle, I think, for... I mean, obviously, not just yourself, Clint, but anyone who does that sort of video, like it seems to get harder and harder over time. I mean, I've seen when you started thrifts, you were finding things like Tandy Coco in, in the world and that PCXT. Right. And I remember um, people like the Game Chasers, like in their early episodes, they were finding things like Little Samson, uh, that Flintstones game. And for them, I think constantly for yourself, and for them, they keep talking about how it gets tougher and tougher. And obviously fans are saying, oh, why don't you make more thrift episodes why don't you make more game chasers and and the simple answer i suppose is we're not finding the stuff it's getting harder and harder to find the stuff that you can really make a video on with with that in mind like kind of leads on to kind of my next subject what what do you guys kind of think of the current kind of retro games market and do you think there is going to be a bust soon do you think it's going to crash soon or just kind of going back to what we were saying five minutes ago with everything going digital do you think it's just going to keep getting I don't want to use the word worse, but just more and more expensive. Like, where, where do you think that's going? Yes, it's going to get more and more expensive. As, as much as I hate to say it, um, we've mm. got... You're going to kill me with realism now. Yes. <laughs> got, sorry, Joe. Um, we've got, you know, we've got groups like Heritage and Water that are um, artificially driving up prices of, of games that are common games, even though they're sealed. Um I see N64 boxed seal games now on eBay for ridiculous prices. Uh, I've got a Dreamcast collection of games, and someone the other day said to me, "Have you seen the price of Cannon Spike on the on the Dreamcast?" And I was like, yeah. "I bought that for fifteen dollars, you know, in a used mm-hmm. bargain bin." And you go on eBay and you look at it, and you're like, "What? What? What's happened here?" You know. So, mm-hmm. I. As much as I I, I want to say that there is a bubble and it's going to burst, I just don't think that's actually accurate. I think um, the prices just keep going up. And and now we're kind of into that generation of um, PS2 and Xbox and GameCube games. They're kind of the the sweet spot for collectors now. The prices of those games are going up in price. I mean, OG Xbox, Clint, you did a video on... all those games probably cost you like less than five bucks, right? From from thrift from thrifting, some of those games now are becoming quite expensive to buy. And um, once once we're done with the GameCube and the PS2, it's going to be PS3 and Xbox 360 games. They're mm-hmm. very very cheap yep. right now, um, but in about three or four years, I think they're going to be really up there in price. Um, and I just I think the cycle will just continue and continue and continue. Um, I do think that, you know, some some systems will kind of taper off a little bit as far as market value. But overall, if you take a look at the overarching retro game collecting slash buying use prices, the market for that, I think in general, it's just going to keep going up. When's the bit rock going to kick in and people find all their games are disintegrated I mean, and suddenly the market That's a good collapses. question. And, I mean, a lot of collectors probably don't even take the games out of the box, right? I mean, they, they want to preserve the packaging. They want to preserve everything about it. So a lot of them, you know, probably don't even consider that. They just put it in their plastic plastic um, protective sleeve and they put it on the shelf. And that's great. You know, if you're a collector, I'm all about that. But I think there's probably a lot of bit rot that's going around that a lot of these collectors don't even realize they have, right? I mean, I think mm-hmm. there's there's something to be said about that, that, you know, maybe test your games as well when you when you buy them, you know. <laughs> I'm looking at Kim's collection, you know, behind her. She's got an incredible collection of games. And, you know, uh, it's a game there that maybe you haven't played for 10 years that you, don't, you haven't even checked the discs and oh, you don't know. absolutely. Yeah. Probably quite a lot of them yeah. are games that have just kind of sp- been sitting there because i can always think of a more convenient way to play them mm. i don't know if it's um if it's the same in america but does it seem to you like the more popular games the most popular and most common games seem to be just going up and up as well it's not just the rare stuff i mean it, when i was in blackpool a couple of weeks ago there was one particular seller who just going to remain nameless was trying to sell um super mario kart on the snes 150 pounds wow sonic sonic 2 on Mega Drive, £30 
for a game that I can think I can get on eBay for a fiver, if that. Mm, yeah. It seems and those. I mean, those most popular games are just going up and up, and it does feel like, unfortunately, we have been saying that the bubble's going to be bursting soon. It feels like we've been saying that for about ten years. And and this and this is what frustrates me as well. Like people are doing that with games that did sell, you know, in the hundreds of thousands and probably in a couple of millions as well. But my concern is exactly what Demetrius just said there is in 10 years time, but people are going to be trying to sell copies of Halo 3 field probably sold like 20 million copies and they're going to be trying to sell it for like hundreds of pounds, like or hundreds of dollars or whatever. Like that really frustrates me because it's like gaming 30 years ago, some of these games, like you say, Kim, they are rare because only 50,000 of them came out or a hundred or whatever, 10,000 was a limited run of them. Whereas games, game consoles, which we're going to consider retro in the next decade tens of millions amount of them out there and that's why i kind of feel like the bubble might well i want the bubble to burst because i want to carry on collecting but i just i, I find it so hard to comprehend that <laughs> like, think, there's, uh, there's 50 there's 100 million copies of gta like why is it expensive <laughs> there's, there's also the, the rarity of people snapping up these very well-known super popular high selling games and then just holding on to them. So mm. if there's enough people doing that and just holding on to every copy of GTA 3 that they find, eventually there's going to be no copies of GTA 3 for anybody else to find, even though yeah. it's sold gangbusters. But, you know, yeah. eventually it's it's like that, especially with the sealed stuff. Uh, mm. Those, you know, I know that's that's becoming more and more of a weird topic. But, I um, mean, you know, it's it's been happening with PC games for a very long time now, too. And that drives me uh, <laughs> just you know, how in the world are some things selling? Like I saw a copy of King's Quest V with the bad artwork, like the, the awful re-release box of King's Quest V for DOS. And it went for $500. Oh, oh wow. Jeez. I for have that on my show. Just, card, yeah. yeah, I've got like yeah. two or three <laughs> copies of it. Like it's just, why? Why is this going up there in value? It, it, it was sealed, I guess. And so that's it. It didn't even matter that, you know, this was a game that if you get it, unsealed 15 bucks all day long on online but you know right. uh, you know any any of those like uh, you'll see a sealed copy of fallout for instance or fallout 2 and that's well over a thousand dollars now and mm. that's just a <laughs> you could find them uh i mean it was always a little bit more valuable than others but when i got mine it was 45 dollars, and that was not even that long ago so yeah uh, <laughs> i don't know wild, it's it? it's constantly what are you paying what are we paying for we're, we're for that, you're paying for a bit of plastic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that wraps around the gate. Yeah, the only reason I like buying well, sealed is because it. I like to unseal them and have that yep. new experience. Mm. Uh, That's what like I do too. I I generally open all my games. I mean, I go, I yeah. go have a couple of sealed things, but most of the time, I will open my games. Yep. Yeah. Do you get hate though on your videos when you do that from some people? Like oh, yeah. you should never open them yeah. <laughs> every single time. Yeah, yeah. But I just like <laughs> have to, I just have to say the same thing. Like I don't like my my games being in a cellophane prison. I would like to take them out, let them breathe. You know, get that experience that I never had as a kid or as a younger adult or whatever, and un being unable to afford a game or completely missing out on a game and you know or a piece of hardware or anything like that like i think that's a really special experience and at the very least i like to make a video about it so i can share some of that you know it's i'm not keeping it all to myself necessarily i'm trying to make a a good video and <laughs> to be honest you know i think it's kind of funny when people were saying at the uh, the xbox that i unsealed or just opened up that was still in the box recently and they were like oh how dare you do that you could have sold it for such and such amount of dollars but i'm like <laughs> yeah well <laughs> i guess that's just too bad i'll just have to cry into my ad revenue about that one <laughs> it kind of paid for itself in that case if you really want to make it all about money but for me it was just i never had one of these things back then i really was excited to have that experience that i always dreamed of having seeing these demo units and you know smelling the cables for the first time and plugging it in and get the, get the disc drive running a disc for the first time however long it's been sealed up in there it's it's really exciting and i i don't quite understand the sealedness of it other than the fact that they look nice on a shelf but at that point, you're just sort of catering to other people who are also inflicted with your sealed sickness, <laughs> I mm. think. <laughs> who are you trying to impress? So, yeah. 
I think it's like we we all wish that the bubble would burst so, you know, collectors can get games and stuff. But like looking at stuff like sports when they buy players and it just increases in price forever. And I think that's just going to probably happen, sadly, with uh, with uh, video game collecting, you know. And yeah. yeah, systems might come in and out, but uh, it'll just keep going and it, more ridiculous headlines will come out and uh, more ridiculous sales, sadly. I'm looking here in our chat, um, John Taylor. Um, he's been looking for a copy of Moonstone um, for the Amiga. And Edvin Helen said there's one currently on eBay for a... One guy's trying to sell it for £300 in Norway at the moment. Um, John had a copy of it, but his mum gave it away to a charity shop when he was at university. <laughs> <laughs> and that makes me think of the amount of things. I mean, you know, I'm not proud of it, but I, I did go through a stage when you know, I kind of got out of retro systems and got, I threw two Amiga 1200s in the bin. What? An Amiga 500. What? This is still a Commodore 16 I remember actually physically putting in the bin. And it's, um, you know, you think back... Now, I wish I didn't do that and how much those systems are worth. But have you got any um, retro regrets, anything like that then in your history, anyone? Oh, pretty much my childhood games, all that, um, went into a skip. Mm. When we moved house, it was just like, we need room. Um, and I wasn't into it at the time. And so, yeah, all my child, no, nothing that's behind me pretty much is from my childhood, unfortunately, because all Mega Drive games, SNES, PlayStation, all the old stuff, just like, oh, don't need it anymore. <laughs> I've got mm. other things. And then it was like, it was only probably about three months later or so that I just thought, what on earth did you just do? Oh, and I bet you ended up everything. Re- rebuying all of them as well. Yeah, I've yeah, I've rebought quite a bit, not not all, but yeah. So when it comes to things like Mega Drive games and that, because yeah, I did have some good stuff back then, which unfortunately yeah, just um went into a landfill somewhere. Oh. We need like a documentary like the E.T. style one where we, we <laughs> dig up the landfill. Yeah. <laughs> well, obviously, Demetrius, you moved, you know, halfway around the world as well. I mean, did you bring your collection with you or is that something you've rebought since you've been um, in the US? Half of it's still back home in Australia. And one of the mm. really great things I love when I go home and visit mum and dad is I go into my old bedroom, I go into the garage and I always find something that I had, you know, from the 90s or the 2000s and I'm like, yeah, this is actually worth a bit of money. So I'm going to bring it back with me. So I, I always dig up some box PC games or, um, or you know, some some more uncommon Saturn games or Dreamcast games, and I just kind of take them back with me. Um, and it's one thing that I really love to do. But, I mean, as far as the collection that I have here, I've, um, I've actually pared it down quite a lot. Like I did a game room video maybe like three years ago now where I had – ikea shelves all around my basement um i'm down to like about a third of that now because i, I kind of got to a point in my life um i'm probably a little older than you guys um where it's like what am i doing with with all this stuff you know like i'm I, i've always loved video games to play video games and the collecting aspect while i've definitely had my moments of being into right now and i think i think i want to say um going forward i'm not really into it in into the collecting side as much as i used to be so uh, i'm more than happy to kind of um you know donate things away or you know donate to museums and things like that so i've actually been paring things down but i do love that feeling of going back home and 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 finding something something new or something that i hadn't seen literally for you know 20 years or so which is it's always fun it's always a stash in the attic, isn't it, yeah. there, at your parents? <laughs> <laughs> well, I did with my magazines, all my old computer magazines. I, I actually gave a load to Ravi, got rid of a load of them. Now I've been buying them all back on eBay again over the last couple of years. <laughs> Crazy. Yeah, it's, it's amazing that how that happens, um, but what can you do? What about you, Clint? Have you always had your collection then, or is this something you started recollecting? How, how did it work? Yeah, I didn't really start collecting again until like 2005 or six, uh, getting back into retro stuff, which, I mean, wasn't even, <laughs> I don't know, seems kind of weird to even think about what was retro then and what it is now. Mm. But uh, yeah, I, 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 at that point, was thinking about some of those items again, mainly because I didn't have uh, any of the stuff from my childhood. Like I, At that point... All the computers were long gone. They ended up in a landfill, you know, the the software. Who knows what happened to it? I know actually a lot of the, the stuff was just burned in a fire. So it's all, that was all just 
gone. So there's a, that whole aspect of it. I just started collecting the things that I remember having on, on occasion, finding them at thrift stores mainly. And uh, at that point, it just became a more active collecting obsession for a good 10 years there. But uh, yeah, I, I haven't actually been seeking things out on purpose <laughs> for a, a good little while now because I sort of scratched that itch very, very well. And uh, at this point, yeah, it's it's been nothing but paring down for a good number of years, which oddly enough, you know, being a YouTuber has made it much uh, more difficult in ways that I didn't anticipate because I've done a number of things in my videos where it's like, oh, I'm showing this and I have this. And then somebody says oh, they have this and this and this that's related. And it started this snowball effect that I never anticipated of just people constantly sending things in, even without a public address or anything like that. It just sort of gets passed around and then people ask about something else. And yeah, that is the whole aspect of this collecting thing that I uh, wasn't I'm still not equipped to handle. I don't know what I'm going to do with all this YouTube stuff because this <laughs> is have not you got a storage last. place still. I do, yes, but yeah. it's so expensive. I, I I don't know what in the world I've I've gotten th three storage places now, and they're wow. all filled wow. up with just the LGR stuff that's been sent in. That's all that's in there. I don't even have my own personal stuff in this place. Um, I try to keep everything outside of the home. Because it was genuinely driving me nuts, um, having things in the house and having this all around all the time. Uh, this is what you see behind me is all that I have here. And this is the office. And this is all that I do in here. So, yeah, there's a, it's just, just a very large swath of things. And I feel like I was becoming slowly overtaken by it. And it was starting to, I don't know, it, I feel held down by it in a way. And I still mm. don't really know what to do with that. Uh, just in terms of it's it's beyond childhood at this point that was satiated like 10 years ago. And now at this point, it's just all the other things that I want to cover or I missed out on or something. But then after that, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what to, uh, to do with it. Everybody keeps saying to start a museum, but I, <laughs> okay. Yeah. That's a lot. That's a lot of time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. You know, I just, at, at the same time, somebody says that I'm like, yeah, but is there somebody I can just send it all to and they can do it? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. And I can have it when I need it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Talk, to, <laughs> yeah. talk to Neil or something. Get the, get that going yeah. because, man, yeah, I don't know. It's it's a lot of physical goods. I think you've got like your childhood in there, but then loads of other people's childhood as well. Yes, yeah. <laughs> so, well, that's the other thing like... too. When you, all these things end up showing up, and they're from other people, and they were sent to me to take care of or go on to the next portion of their existence or showing a video or something and at this point it's kind of impossible to do because there's so much of it that i will never get to it in my lifetime so there's something else that needs to be figured out with this i almost wish that there were like a uh, uh i don't even know what i mean I like how hollywood has these big warehouses where it's like a prop place and then all of the yeah. different studios and creators can use the stuff that's in there like I wish there was that for retro YouTubers. Yeah, I've been tossing <laughs> you that know, around um, in my head. Like just in, in in Indiana Jones when they put yeah. it at the end with the arc. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just just Clint's collection. That's what like, it's looking like at this point. I, I would love to be able to share it around very easily, but the logistics yeah. of that are nuts. <laughs> a Hannah, a Hannah full of different people's childhoods, sort of retro mm. retro gaming dream catcher. Yes. You know, actually, it's quite quite interesting. Do you ever get approached by like movie companies for props and that kind of thing? I, I imagine there must be a market out there for yes, you know, renting old machines. That and... happens rather often, right. um, and it's something that I have only done once, and I probably will never do it again because it was such a pain. Um, it was some company, and I never got the item back. Just never did. They're like it got. Oh, wow. You know, it was there. They supposedly used it. There was all this back and forth and paperwork and things to sign and an NDA on my part because I can't talk about this and all this. And so it just, I don't know what ever happened to it. The computer is just gone. And so they uh, they kind of ended up in wherever they have their props. And it was, you know, a mixture of some management changed and some other paperwork shift shuffled around and then something got lost or who knows. So, uh, yeah, I, I don't really dabble in that but it would be kind of cool to have that for uh <laughs> people that i trust perhaps <laughs> you know just to have access to it because i send out a lot of my things you know if there's ever another youtuber that needs a thing i'm happy to you know film footage or send them the item or whatever but you know yeah 
I do remember you know talking about we mentioned the you know your storage for your systems and stuff before, and I remember you did a very honest video about the the work life balance of being a YouTuber and a retro collector as well. I mean, I find it quite interesting. Obviously, you're all making regular content. Is that something that, how do you kind of work that life retro balance and actually, you know, having a life outside of retro? Is that something that you struggle with or is that something that you've kind of got down now, do you think? I mean, I know I've struggled with it on and off forever Mm -hmm. (laughs) this entire time. Uh, It's, uh, yeah, I mean, it's something I'm always trying to, to manage in terms of being able to turn my brain on or off in the right ways at the right times, because, you know, working here at home or even over at storage or wherever, you know, they, you just get in the mode where you just keep going and going and going. And then it's, it's hard to click that off, especially when there's, I don't have any coworkers. I don't, I don't work with anyone. Uh, don't have anybody else to really answer to except myself here. So it's very easy to just keep on working for, to, you know, multiple days straight. And then I just sort of wear myself out for that week. And then it, you know, sort of snowballs. Um, and the other side of that is it can become also very easy to just put things off and say, okay, well, yeah, I don't necessarily need to work today. I deserve this day off, but then that snowballs as well. And then you don't end up with this weekly schedule thing that I've been trying to do forever. So yeah, it's, you know, I'm, I'm currently doing this like three weeks on one week off kind of right. thing. Um, but on the week off I'm working, so I don't really know <laughs> what I'm doing. It just gives me more opportunity to make deeper or more complex videos. Uh, yeah, I, I still haven't figured it out. <laughs> How do you find it, Kim? Um, it's that video really resonated with me. That one about finding the mm. work life balance because I think for full time people who do this full time, it is it's a challenge. I mean, I try to just concentrate just try and make sure that I was just make time just for little things that are just completely unconnected with retro at all whether it's I always try to make time for a hour and a half or so practice on bass every day and something mm. little like that kind of sets things up I I do other things outside I do amateur dramatics and stuff like that that kind of gets gets me out there in a way that's not just you know going out on events or whatever and drinking and all that um which is obviously not a good way of coping with the full-time youtube thing um but the i find it like the closer you get to like your subject like the less you do things like in that free time that like, i find it very difficult to just even play games yeah. without yeah. actually thinking yeah. oh um what's the content that i can make out of this that like, it's hard to um play games for fun anymore mm. almost well i mean or well, I mean, it's fun still, but without even thinking about any kind of work that goes with it. Um, so yeah, I mean, the work-life balance is again something I think I'm still trying to figure out myself, and it can get quite difficult at times. It's like if you work in a chip shop and you know you don't want chips all the time. <laughs> <laughs> the good I was wondering where you were going with that. <laughs> well, I'd still want chips. <laughs> What about you, Dimitri? How, how do you kind of balance it? Um, I just want to agree with both what Kim and and, and Clint mm. have said. It, it's very difficult, you know. Um, I'm I'm someone that is very schedule oriented, so I've got s- set routines every week where I make content. Um, the difficulty is unplugging and, and switching off. And and you know, Clint, you mentioned taking every third week off. I, I couldn't imagine doing that right now. I mean, um, that just sounds like you know, red flags because the algorithm is just going to completely tank my channel, which that's probably mostly psychological because I know I make good content and anyone that make does good content, you guys, you'll, you know, that, you know, how, how your audience reacts to your, your content. So it it probably is okay taking a week off, right? Because, you know, your, your audience will be there, you know, um, the, the following week, but a lot of it is in the mind, you know, YouTube tells you, just keep pumping content out. You know, that's, that's what we want. We want you to, yeah. to keep making videos. So um, I find it very difficult to unplug as well. You know, I, I'm mostly uh, working on weekends, you know, to get videos out for, for Monday. And um, that's kind of the way that I've been doing things for the last three, four years. And I've tried to stop working on weekends, but I, I just can't. And so it's really now, you know, what can I do to, you know, to, to change things around? And, um, you know, uh, I, I, I'm struggling with it as well. I, I, 
I'm not going to not going to lie about it. It's it's something that's very very difficult to do. Once you get into YouTube and then you kind of get some success and you start making money, it's very difficult to kind of you know push the off button and and just kind of step away for a little while because you know you just don't know what's going to happen when you get back. And um, you know I think that's the reality of of content creation at this time. I think I think with us three as well. Like if we missed a episode for a week god i don't know what would happen like ah, oh, we just panic if if we're like you know getting close to when there's an episode deadline yep. but i, I think, think having the deadlines helps though doesn't it you know no, yeah. a new episode is going to drop on a certain day then you've you've got something to work towards but it's, it's still that kind of feeling and you know i think with three of us we can maybe share the slack and kind of move it around a bit but i can imagine it's a lot harder when yeah. when you're you're on your own and you've got to be self-motivated you can't get that from other sources as well yeah the platforms do us precious little favors i mean as youtubers we can help each other out when we're in groups and, and if we find that we're struggling with things or i mean of course if we have a, a certain base obviously some people some youtubes a lot of youtubes now more and more employ people mm. that, that that is a thing um but yeah it can be very very tricky to keep things going i mean regardless of whether it's youtube twitch patron depending on how wide your base is it's it's like spinning plates basically isn't it and that's perfect that's the yeah. metaphor yeah. isn't mm-hmm. it making yeah. sure none falls off <laughs> and always at the mercy of that algorithm that i think youtube if they had it their own way you'd upload every single day wouldn't you i mean uh, and, yeah, it does it does have a psychological effect yeah, I yeah mean, they they want you to upload every day that's that's the thing you know i've always kept to like a, a weekly schedule and sometimes i'll drop a midweek video but uh, mm. i there's no way I could do a video every single day. That would just no. completely kill me, I think. Well, as I mentioned before, another hour has just shot by. Um, and I feel like we've barely scratched the surface. But if you've got a, just a couple more minutes, and we've got a few um, questions from our listeners on uh, on, on YouTube, if, uh, if you've got a couple of minutes, yeah, everyone. Of course. Absolutely. Yep. Fantastic. Well, let's go through a few of these then. Now, John Taylor, uh, he just wants to say, actually, congrats on 300. He listened to this podcast for the last few years. It's cost me a fortune. We made him start collecting, apparently. So uh, oh, yeah, wow. we, we apologize about <laughs> that, John. Um, Retro Hamer's been on as well. He said, does Clint still have the spectrum from his video from about 10 years ago? Yes, I do. And mm. a whole ton of interesting peripherals and add-ons and, and um, flash devices and things that have shown up since then that I have been meaning to cover in some sort of follow-up. And here it is a decade later, and I still haven't done it. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I, I haven't really gotten rid of any of those old machines. I still have them all in some form. I think about the only one that has died was that Amiga 500 that I had, but have since gotten a couple of 1200s and a 600. So, you know, yeah, just haven't gotten, and a 2000 recently, geez. Nice. <laughs> so yeah, still have it. Do you, did you have a better way of putting it up then on, you had to put it up on the projector, didn't you, when you made it? I the, did, yeah. yeah I didn't I have a PAL TV at that point. Now I have a few of those and a number of handy little conversion devices. Thank goodness for all the adapters and things that are out now. It's so much easier to display stuff and capture. <laughs> um hide 209 uh, vgm remixer has asked a question for you kim um what's your favorite sega mega drive game i bet this changes by the day does it it does change a bit but <laughs> there's two i would say one's a childhood favorite one i got into later on um streets of rage 2 is the childhood favorite i mean i've been playing that game since 1992 <laughs> um, joe's with you there <laughs> it's to me as far as it's just it's everything that a beat em up should be really from the music just to the, the range of moves the range of characters the sets it's just i can't think there's not there's nothing i'd ever want to change about that the other one that um is something i actually got into a fair bit later was fantasy star 4 i mean i'm not a big rpg person generally i mean there's a the but the few that i have played to any degree are games that i love dearly and i played through fantasy star 4 a few years back now and it was just wonderful rpg experience one that kind of really touched me in ways that are quite personal actually in a lot of in a lot of ways it's um had a great effect on my life without getting too um soppy about it so yeah those two would be definitely the ones for me by some distance 
Um, Edvin Helen's been on. He said, question for MVG. Will you port anything to the Amiga in the future? Oh, man, I would love to go back and do some Amiga stuff. Um, I really, really miss working on that system. It's so much fun to port games to the Amiga, but I just don't have the time right now. But I will... I don't want to close the door on it because I, I, I want to get back into that stuff because it's so much fun. So never say never, but um, just, I guess, keep an eye on my channel. We'll see what happens. This next question. Oh, my God, this is a difficult one. Uh, Gideon's been on. Um, he said, if your guests had to run down to just one system, so if you had to cut your collection down to just one system, what would it be? What about you, Clint? Could you pick one? Yeah, it would be my favorite. It may not be the most versatile, but it's my favorite. Uh, the Compact Presario 425, little all-in-one 486 system, uh, DX4 overdrive, and 20 megabytes of RAM. Yeah, it's just uh, my favorite little system. I've had it mm. longer than anything else, picked it up, <laughs> saved it from the trash uh, in high school. It was going in the in the garbage in the dumpster that day, and I just surreptitiously took it home when I wasn't supposed to. And uh, I've had it ever since. It's great. It's complete. It's basically turning orange at this point, but uh, <laughs> it's fine. It's earned that yellowing. <laughs> what about you, Kim? Goodness. I think today... And it, this is something that would well probably change every hour. Seeing as I'm wearing a sensible soccer t-shirt, I think I'm just going to have to say the Commodore Amiga. Or mm. Um That was the system that got me into Amigas. And I think if you had a Commodore Amiga, you'd have so much stuff that I think is still kind of relatively unspoken about. I'm just whether it's from like the late period or even from the prime years of the system. There, there's so much to learn still, I think, about what people are making on their over the course of its time so yeah it's a system that i adore and i guess today i'll pick that one the others would be about you demetrius yeah. i want to go with the amiga 1200 as well um nice. I, I absolutely adore that system and it's so cool it's so compact you can just put it under your arm and walk around with it it's it's awesome <laughs> um, it's expandable you can connect it to the internet you can accelerate it you, you can add memory compact flash you can even emulate PC games on that thing. So I mean, what what else what else do you need? So uh, I I think the twelve hundred is is my pick for sure. I do love the A twelve hundred as well. Actually, I built this studio here to do work in. Um, I was in about two days. I've got an Amiga twelve hundred now over to this side, um, all set up. But I spent about two and a half hours trying to set the Wi Fi up instead of working the other day <laughs> with so, the um, ST <laughs> behind you. Yeah, head. the Atari uh, making an appearance there as well. Um, this is quite an interesting one. Um, did Kim? Ever progressed the X68000 she was bringing back to life a few years ago? That's from John Taylor. Um, if I just tilt this camera up a bit, <laughs> you can see it still, I think. Yeah, no. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, right. um, I just don't have the space. Um, and I'm not, I'm, as, as, as I kind of alluded to earlier, I'm not the most electronically minded person. Um, I'd love to. And I, as soon as I saw it on Facebook, I wanted, because it's like, oh, it's like 30 odd quid for what is essentially just a, wow. it's a shell. Um, mm. it doesn't have a, it has like the board, but it doesn't have like a hard drive, pretty much power supply, any other components. And I, I saw of ways that they could be gotten, but, um, yeah, it's just not something I ever really managed to get around to. I mean, it's cool seeing up there. It's a nice thing to have. Um, I will probably have to get rid of it at some point just cause it's massive and it might buckle that ikea shelf eventually <laughs> <laughs> suddenly the whole load comes falling down yeah um but yeah it just it time went away on that one too much other stuff alas um andrew s has asked if um you could travel back in time to any point in the past and spend a day there when would it be and why what about you clint Ooh. Like 1976 Homebrew Computer Club, oh, <laughs> you yeah. know, just to see all of that hype over things like the Apple One and all the different homebrew things that people were, you know, bringing their own keyboards and their own displays and you know, just everybody talking about all of these exciting new things happening in the world of personal computing. I think just to just, you know, be a fly in the wall, not even talk to anyone just see that you know the the couple pictures that exist just electrify my imagination of some of those meetings and i i can <laughs> i don't know it, it was just a wild time and a place just at the birth of personal computing when nobody knew at all what was going to happen next and within a, a year things were just going to blow up and nobody knew it it's great and you could show your copy of a uh... 
pirated Microsoft Basic to yes. Bill Gates and see how he reacts. Yes. <laughs> Get him to sign that infamous letter. <laughs> what about you, Demetrius? Where do you go then in your, in your DeLorean? Um, I don't know. If, I mean, I like, uh, I, I have a lot of fond memories of um, computer stores that had, you'd walk in and just have walls of C64 games everywhere. Oh, yeah. And I just kind of miss those days. I, I know um, Neil did a, um, at his, at his, uh, his cave he uh recreated a, a, a shop front which looked really awesome by the way so yeah. that that really brought back a lot of memory so any one of those kind of computer stores that that would sell not just commodore 64 but apple and um specky and amstrad and bbc games i mean that that's something that i really miss i'd, I'd love to revisit that yeah i'd love to walk into my childhood gaming store again as it yep. was when i was like eight years open old, up the checkbook and basically buy out the whole store right <laughs> Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what about you, Kim? Um, tough one. I mean, of course, again, yeah. There's the childhood gaming stores from my youth. You could go to that point when you were at the skip. Yeah, yeah. That's and just true. put your hand. Yeah. <laughs> Good <laughs> no. Yeah. So that is that's a tempting option. Yeah, just be like, nope, not doing that. I suppose, kind of. I was also thinking if I don't just restrict it to times when I was alive. Um, sort of 1983 or so in the UK scene when you're really getting like the boom times for the UK computers and just had so many different ones around and so many, I suppose, people working in their sheds doing Lord knows what. And and that was like the time when IT was really starting to become like very much pushed by um, the government as well. So it just seemed to go all over the place. You had the bedroom code as you had, you know, you can make this game, you can earn a million pounds may not necessarily have been the reality, but that's how they pushed it. I mean, I suppose certainly as someone who covers a lot of that era, that would have to be my pick <laughs> to actually be a mm-hmm. flying wall and experience myself, perhaps um, just sit in um, Clive Sinclair's boardroom or whatever and try to dodge the flying phones. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I just want to live in every scene of Micro Men. I just want to be in all of those yep. scenes. <laughs> perfect. <laughs> Um, we've got a couple here about videos that you might be doing that you know are not necessarily um, retro and tech related. Hags Lab said, "Any more LGO Foods videos coming?" <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's always something in the works there. Uh, whenever I come up with uh, an interesting sandwich or soup or something, uh, yeah, why not? <laughs> and fcat asks uh, kim if you'll do any more non-gaming videos um there's always some things that kind of get into my mind um whether it's something that i end up doing on the second channel i mean obviously i do do like wrestling stuff on patreon which is kind of very much separate from everything else um i do if i get something that entices me that makes me want to follow my muse i do like to um say get out into a video form even if it doesn't necessarily end up like doing brilliantly or whatever um so there'll probably always be something i can't never say what i mean i would like to do like certainly before the pandemic i had an idea of like going around the houses and kind of doing a lot of stuff more about like british culture sort of say like food culture as well as it happens in the uk there was a lot of stuff i was thinking about that stuff um, also business related things that kind of ends up alluding to in like gaming documentaries stuff about companies perhaps delving further into that side of things so yeah there's always little things here and there that I kind of think oh, that'd be nice it's just you know whether they actually get done or not sometimes sometimes after a couple of days I think mm, maybe not and then other times it actually ends up becoming a video <laughs> you ever struggle with turning all of your hobbies into videos or being tempted to because I know I am <laughs> oh yeah. 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 all the yeah. things that I'm interested in that'd be a great video that would be a great video but then I, I it's going to turn into work and I won't enjoy it <laughs> yeah exactly yeah. <laughs> you, need, you need that separation don't yeah. you yeah um mm-hmm. we've got one from Alex Andre Filion here and it says um uh, which which guest would you like to interview on the on the retro hour? This is oh, for, for us, us for us oh, okay. free. Yeah. See, um, to me, it was always yeah, Clive like Sinclair. Dream one. Yeah, I would have yeah. loved to have Clive Sinclair on. Um, obviously, R.I.P. Sir Clive. He would have been yeah someone. I, I just imagine he's, he had so many interesting yeah. stories to tell. He he would have been very blunt as well, wouldn't he? And, yeah. I'd hope so. <laughs> um, mine would have been Kevin Mitnick, and I oh, really love to get him on still mm. because he was. He was doing hacking and just amazing stuff before anybody was. And uh, he was kind of made an example for it. And his story's like 
absolutely fascinating. So, Kevin, if you're ever watching, yeah, uh, yeah, answer to my emails. <laughs> <laughs> Ravi lo- loves all the hacking underground stuff, though. Oh, totally. Uh, what about you, Joe? You see, I don't want to butcher anybody's names, but it'd be a lot of Japanese developers yeah, yeah, for yeah. a lot of, you know, yeah. Streets of Rage and stuff like that. Um, and also, like, the director of the Resident Evil games and stuff. They'd be, like, absolute dreams, but the logistics of it, yeah. and language and barriers and stuff like that would probably just yeah. never happen. Um, but I've had, you know, a lot of dream people mm-hmm. on. Do you know what I mean? Um, you know, not 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 to brown nose anybody or anything like that, but, like, I loved it when, you know, I loved it when every, everybody had on, but, like, Clint, like, you were actually one of my favourite YouTubers of all time. So when we had you on, like, that blew my mind. Um we had, you know, Metal Jesus on. Um, we've had a lot of people on who, you know, a lot of YouTubers for me. Mm. Um, really, really, really cool. But yeah, probably some of the Japanese developers would be like dreams come true as well. Yeah, we just need to get like um, Google Translate. Yeah, better, doesn't it? <laughs> just like on our phones or something. Or yeah. something. <laughs> I've uh, gotten um, Peter Molling you on because that would be a great interview. Oh, no, he would oh, be great. Really love to. I, I don't know. He, he kind of had a thing where he wasn't talking to the press, mm. but I think maybe, maybe mm. we can... Uh, Strong arm him yeah. into it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Kind of it'd be it'd be fascinating. He's done he's done a couple mm. of interviews since obviously all the fins went down. But yeah, he has kind of stuck mostly to not really speaking to the press. Mm. And I also think the GTA team, uh, Rockstar, the guys from Rockstar, yeah, tend to really tend to one. be really quiet. And I've never really seen any big podcast with the houses i guess the like the stamper brothers would be a really big one too if you could manage yeah. manage oh, to yes. get them on that yeah. would be that would be a great interview you know it's crazy because when we started this you know the people that thought we'd run out of guests after 10 episodes and we've done 300 i still think there's so many more that we yeah. could get on you know it's about the retro is always changing as well isn't it you know what was what was retro when we started this six years ago it's kind of changed now you know we wouldn't have covered playstation 2 and gamecube stuff really then but now that definitely mm. feels like it's retro today so yeah, there's always going to be new retro, if uh, if that makes sense, I think. Um, just got time for a couple of more quick ones from our chat here as well. Uh, Ewan Matthews has said, um, after MG, MVG's work on Quake, if he could remaster any other game, what would it be? Oh, man. Uh, I get asked this quite a lot. Um, I think I'd love to do a Silent Hill remake. Um, I mean, I don't oh, think yeah. that's something that would ever fall on my lap, but that that's one game that I, I've really... I mean, I love the PlayStation 2 version and I didn't like the HD collection, so I would love uh, to to be involved in a remake of that. And I guess the other low-hanging fruit is Metal Gear Solid. I mean, I think that's another game that I would, I'd love to bring back. And there's one more, one more here as well from Carl. Um, Christmas memories. What's your favourite Christmas memories from when you were a kid? Is it one that kind of sticks in your memory? But you came any any Christmas in particular? Or yeah, a gift that you got? 1997 um, PlayStation for experiencing that for the first time, and for the first time playing what would become my all-time favorite game, Final Fantasy VII. Um, right. Having that sort of <laughs> blow my mind back in the day, having played a little bit, you know, Sega and Amiga for the past like years before that. And again, to experience 3D. I mean, looking at some of the games now that I was that I got, and I kind of got FF7, Tomb Raider 2, and um, ISS Pro. And especially to look at some of that ISS Pro in particular and compare it to like modern football games, it almost kind of sounds quaint to say how mind blown it was. But truly, the first time playing that, and it, and it still actually holds up quite well as a football game, to be honest. But mm. first time actually playing it, it's like, oh my lord, it's just like watching football on the television. <laughs> in- <Yeah. laughs> uh, apart from the uh, repetitive commentary in that oh, game, the, the commentary <laughs> in that game is amazing. It's so cheesy. Mm. It's Alan Partridge. <laughs> you must have lead in his head. Yeah. <laughs> that was one of them. <laughs> what about you, Clint? Then any Christmas memory that springs to mind? Yeah, I got to say, uh, Christmas nineteen ninety four. I asked for one thing, and that was SimCity two thousand for DOS. And uh, at, like all year long. Just that was it. I and nailed it into the parents' head and anybody who would listen. And Christmas came and went, and it wasn't there. <laughs> and it was no. like, oh, no. <laughs> I was seriously – I had to have been crying at some point. I'm just like, ah, you know. Uh, and then go over to, um, you know, make the trip to the grandparents' house. And lo and behold, there it was under the tree. Oh, they tricked you. They tricked me, and which was crazy because my grandparents didn't – they've never – owned a computer didn't know anything about them uh, it was not at all what i expected from from them you know you usually get like socks or 
t-shirts or something. <laughs> but yeah, that was that was a fantastic little, you know, the parents got one over on me. I still got to get them back for that sometime. So. <laughs> <laughs> that about you, Dimitri, send any uh, Christmas memory that springs yeah, to mind? Yeah, 95 PlayStation 1 for me as well. Yeah, that was... Yeah. I, that was above and beyond anything else. I was just so hyped for that. And when it came out, I was not disappointed. That was just a, an amazing system. Um, I didn't, again, I didn't like you guys. I didn't think I was going to get it. Uh, I asked for it. I didn't because I think the Australian price was like six ninety nine or something, something, you know, outrageous. Right. Um, but no, I ended up getting one and uh, I, I, I loved PlayStation ever since. Well, it's been an absolute pleasure um, celebrating our 300th episode with some wonderful people. So thank you so much, Clint, Demetrius, and Kim for uh, joining us for the celebrations. It's been a pleasure having you on again. Thanks for having us. Thank you. It's Cheers, guys. Pleasure. Yeah, we just want to say a massive thank you as well to um, not only our amazing patrons, but our listeners as well. You know, we do the show week in, week out. And uh, what about another 300 episodes of this podcast, Andrew? We I, I would love another 300 episodes. <laughs> 300 more guests, but I yeah. would love that. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for checking out this special episode and our things. Normal service will resume from next week. Um, I think the Christmas quiz is going to be the next uh, big thing, isn't it? Which is oh, gosh. Up, I, I will <laughs> regain my crown that <laughs> yeah, I yeah. never had. And yeah. Ravi's come last every year for what, six years now. Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, so it could all change. <laughs> but thanks again to our amazing guests and thank you for listening. We will see you next week. Happy 300th episodes, Dan, Ravi and Joe. Bet you didn't think six years in you'd still be doing this show. Just want to say a big thank you for entertaining me on long commutes, keeping me sane during COVID, and mostly for building a sense of community for us all, for the show, Discord and social media. The archiving of the interviews will help preserve our joint passions, and you should all be proud of your achievements. Roll on, episode 600. Hi, Joe, Dan and Ravi. It's Neil from Sunny Aylesbury here, wishing you a big congratulations for your 300th episode. Hope you're out celebrating somewhere where there are lots of retro arcade machines to play and my favorite episode is actually one that you recorded recently with Dino Dini it was really interesting to hear his thoughts on the rivalry with sensible soccer and the impact that had at the time and also that's to this day still hope you managed to make another 300 episodes and keep up the good work and I look forward to listening to the episode when it comes out bye Hi gents, Gideon here. I uh, just wanted to send over my congratulations for hitting the big 300 show. I've been a listener since the early days, a bit of an Amiga nuts. I remember stumbling across the podcast for the first time and thinking I'd struck gold here. And you talk about things like the Amiga demo scene and, and shows like Bad Influence. Um, standout episodes for me have been the Charlie Booker and the Dominic Diamond interviews. And I love the monthly patron hangouts as well. It's starting to feel like a real monthly virtual pub club. Um, so I really look forward to that. Uh, not much more to say, really. Just, just you still be really proud of yourselves. It's, it's a great show. Um, the amount of content you've covered over the past 299 shows is is crazy, really. So well done. Cheers, Dan, Ravi, and Joe. Hopefully you'll be here in another 300 episodes time. Take care. Bye bye. Hello, guys. How are you doing here? Garth here, aka Retro Hammer. Just wanted to say a huge congratulations on reaching 300 episodes. Um, I'm trying to think. I think it was episode five where I may have found you. Uh, let, let me see, Tim, Tim right? Four or five. And to be honest, I've been listening to every single episode since, guys. And uh, it's been absolutely brilliant. Keeps me going for my walks to work. And usually when I'm sitting around just playing a bit of retro myself, like everybody else. Either way, guys, I'm looking forward to many more interviews, especially some of my favourites. Hopefully may come back in the future, like, again, the Oliver Twins, maybe even Dominic Diamond, who's probably my favourite interview so far. And um, cannot wait, guys. Let's look forward to the 1000th episode. Hey, guys, my name's Scott Garrett, and I live in Central Texas. Love the podcast. Congratulations. Uh, here's to the next 300, y'all. Hi guys, congratulations on reaching show number 300. Listen every week and your show inspires me to keep adding to my retro collection at northdevonretroarchive.co.uk. Keep up the good work. Here's to another 100 episodes. Hey, Wiz1976 here, coming from the UK. Well, congratulations. Happy 300. What a journey over the past six years or so fantastic work you're all you all work so hard uh, just thank you for what you do it sheds 
light on the dark moments and uh, on, on the happier times. It's the cherry on top, so keep up the good work. They say that nostalgia is um, homesickness for the past, and, well, you definitely satiate that. Keep up the good work. It is uh, truly enjoyed by many. Bye. Celebrate good time. No, 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 sorry, guys, we won't go there. Hi, guys, it's Rich Pemberton, a.k.a. Retro Fun for everyone. Just wanted to say a massive congratulations. 300 episodes. What a huge, huge achievement. And not only that, I just wanted to say a personal thank you for the amount of time and effort it has put in to put those 300 shows together. Um, I'm very, very pleased to be a patron of you guys and some of the extra content to understand the amount of time and work that goes into putting those shows together. I really want to say thank you. So personally to Dan, to Ravi and to Joe, thanks very much guys for the hard work you've put in over the years. Uh, It really has made many, many, many of my drives to and from work and to other places fly by. Um, especially like I say growing up in the 80s starting off with the master system all the way through console guy really really for many many years Um, understand a little bit more about the computer side with Dan and Ravi and some of the guests it's been fantastic so once again thanks so so much guys and here's the next 300 episodes all the best hi Dan Ravi and Joe my name is Tej I've been listening for a few years now I wish to honor your commitment to and passion for the podcast. I feel like I'm among friends, just having a weekly catch-up. Congratulations on your 300. This is FCAT. So 300 episodes in, I think I started talking to you even before the podcast, if you can believe it. I think we've been in communication. Um, 300 episodes in, you're running out of things to talk about. You may have to change it to the retro Lionel Trains Hour. But uh, that's all I wanted to say. Keep up the... The good work. Uh, Maybe we can get to episode 600. (laughs) Good morning, Retro Hour from New Zealand. Even in episode two, there wasn't any doubt that you would fly past 300 episodes. Happy 300th birthday, Retro Hour. Ravi, Dan and Joe, have a great night and uh, enjoy 300 more, as we will. Hi guys, it's Dave Moore, one of the Patreons. Just wanted to say thank you very much for 300 fantastic shows. Congratulations for reaching it. In terms of a favourite show, anything involving the Amiga or the 80s and 90s uh, retro gaming scene. Absolutely fantastic. Keep up the good work, guys, and here's to another 300 episodes. See ya. Hey, Dan, Ravi and Joe. Uh, Thomas, a.k.a. Hi209, the VGM remixer here. Congratulations on 300 episodes on your fantastic uh, podcast. I think it was about a a year ago that a colleague of mine recommended your podcast, and I've been hooked ever since. Uh, You usually keep me company during my Friday morning jog, and uh, uh, even though we haven't met in real life, I think we have a lot of things in common, like... um, Dan, you and me both have a deep appreciation for the Amiga, and uh, Ravi, you and me both seem to enjoy making quirky electronic music. And Joe, um, you and me are both massive fans of Resident Evil and Castlevania, so that's all cool. Um, Well, congratulations on 300 episodes. I hope uh, you'll make 300 more. Cheers. (laughs) 